Okay, welcome everybody. We have uh, a nice group in the room and we have a nice group on Zoom and I dare say they're Now, I wouldn't be so presumptuous as to say such a thing. Uh, but what I'm going to suggest to you as an alternative um, is rather um, radical and um, not acceptable by everybody. I put my cards on the table. My wife would not let me do this. It was a few years that I wanted to do it. Now we do it, and she's a big fan. Um, but at first, she was very resistant, being conservative with a small c. Uh, so. Uh, Please, uh, if you are shocked by uh, my suggestions, then uh, I apologise in advance. Um, don't feel uh, obliged at all to take anything that I say seriously. Um, I will not be offended if any of you write to me or say on a WhatsApp, what a load of rubbish, I'm not doing any of that. Uh, but if one or two of you actually try one or two of these things and you come back to me afterwards and say, hey, that was great, then I'd like to hear that as well. Um, uh, because that's what's happened in our family. Uh, now that we do these things, uh, my kids have all said, yeah, this is the way to do it. So um, that's just the intro. I'd like to uh, dedicate this shiur for a refuah shleima for Rachel Hana Bat Tirza Freida, um, and also to the memory of Moshe Ben Shragafan, whose yorkshire it was. Well, yesterday, technically, uh, because we're already uh, past Nariv. So we'll dedicate it for, uh, in his memory too. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, his neshama and Rachel's refua will come, al come al along with that. Okay, right. So um, the Seder is, of course, the, me the meaning of the word Seder is order. Okay order. And why is it called a seder? Because there appears to be a set order in which to do things. Okay, you come out, you make kiddush, you do uh, on kadesh, all that stuff, right? Yeah, all those 15 steps that we have to do. I mean, you end up with nirza at the end of it. Okay, um, and there's a set way to do it. You do your kiddush, and then you do your karpas, and then you do your manishtana, and then you do your Avadi Mayino, and then you talk about the four sons. Uh, and if you're in our house, then you have an argument because that always causes an argument. The four sons, uh, I've got four sons, by the way. Uh, so they all have to fight to see who's going to be the Russia. They all want to be the Russia. Um, and so anyway, and then you do your, your, your Rabbi Yakiva and Rabbi Tarzan sitting around B'nai Brak. Uh, then you get to a bit of the, you know, the, the, the silly bits where you say, no, 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 there weren't 50 Maccas, there were 250 Maccas. No, 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 there were 300, 500, 700,000. Uh, and I think we're familiar with this, right? And then we, do, we look at our watches and say, come on, come on, I'm starving, right? When's this meal coming along? And you have to go through the matzah, maro, and now we're getting some like this. We've got some food. It might not taste it, right? This matzah, but at least we've got some food. And the maro and the charosa, it might be quite tasty. Then we get the sandwich, the uh, mikdash kehillel. Um, and then finally, at like, you know, 10.30, if you're lucky, what do we do? We get out of the soup and knedlech, as long as we don't know. So we had that shield last week, Billy. You missed it. You missed the Kabrox shield. Um, so, um, so by the time we get to the meal, everybody is hungry for a scarf. Some people by then, quite a lot, I would suggest, have had enough or a bit bored. And then you have this big press. And then you're meant to, after that, have another two cups of wine after that. And Hallel and Nirza and all the, the 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 singing bits. And by the time you get to Chadkat, you're half the tables asleep. The other half have gone upstairs to bed. And that's the seder, right? That's the order that we do it in. Does that sound familiar to anyone around here? Yeah. Okay. 
There's a great book called How to Survive <laughs> by a guy called uh, Rabbi, I think it was David. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It came out in the 1980s. There's one about Rosh Hashanah as well. Oh, it's called The Pace of the Pesach Survival Guide. That's what it was called. Uh, the Rosh Hashanah one's called the Rosh Hashanah Survival Guide, and that's purple, and the Pesach one is a blue one. Well, I'm mentioning it to you. It's a great book because it, 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 it explains you how to survive the Seder. But the reason I'm mentioning it to you is the front cover has the most fantastic picture on it of a Seder. There's one guy there falling asleep, another one picking his nose, another one who's who's got his uh, Haggadah upside down and he's trying to figure it out what it says. Uh, and then there's the, the the leader of the Seder, the father at the end, uh, at the end of the table, with a stern face looking down and nobody's taking no notice of anybody. It's the archetypal, everybody's worst Seder all in one picture. And that's what we've got to try and avoid. That's the whole point of what I'm going to try and uh, um, go through with you tonight. And I started with the word Seder because there is a set order that, in which you do it. Um, but I'm going to suggest to you the first radical thing, to change the order. Oh, Joel's eyebrows just went up there. Uh, check his pulse quick. OK, uh, I'm going to suggest that you change the order because that's what we have done uh, in our house. OK, so. Um, let me ask you this question. Fairly early on in these, these proceedings, we have the favourite bit. It's the favourite bit if you're a kid, because you get to stand on the chair and you say, Manishtana. And it's a favourite bit if you're a parent, because you get to yeah, hear your child do that. And it's even more favourite if you're a grandparent, because you can sit and quell and collect nachas from the grandchildren. Right? Okay, now what do they have? Okay, what do they ask? Manishtana Rainaze. Matzah. This night we we matzah. We haven't eaten any yet when they say the question, right? They like, we haven't eaten any. So how can they ask that question at the beginning of the day? Do we haven't eaten, eaten any matzah yet? How do they know we're going to eat matzah? Second question. It's a hurt. We haven't had that either. So why are they asking that right now? It's not, it doesn't seem to be in the right seder, does it? Third one, dipping. We have actually done one dipping by then. We've done the carapace. Comes before Manish Tana, but the second one. Or are in Kharose. We haven't done that. Either. So that's the third one that we've got the four questions that are not right in the right order. And the fourth question, why on this night do we lean and not sit when we eat? Well, we haven't done that either, really. We've done it for the first cup of wine, Kiddish, but that's all. We haven't had any food yet to demonstrate this. This uh, like. How do the children know? That's the whole point. No. Okay. So, so the whole the whole point of of the the question and answer uh, style of the seder is because we're meant to pique the interest of the children, and they should ask questions. So. It's clear, isn't it, that the questions are not in the right place because they're asking questions about things that haven't yet happened. OK, so who are we kidding that they're asking questions? They're not asking questions at all. They're just spouting out the things that they've learned in a nice tune, which is also fine. But if we're going to make this meaningful, then we have to ask, why did the Baal Haggadah make the Manishtana out of order? Because clearly the Manishtana should be said, should be asked after the meal. After the meal, the kid would say, imagine a kid has never been to a Seder before, right? It's his first Seder that he, rem he remembers. Six-year-old child, let's say, seven, eight-year-old child, let's say. After the meal, it's a reasonable question. Hey, Abba, why have we only had answer tonight? Abba, why have we even had bitter herbs tonight? That's a bit weird, isn't it? Thirdly, why are we dipping all this twice? We're dipping in. And the fourth thing, why were you slocking around at the table and leaning all over the place? Never seen me do that before. You always tell us we've got to sit up straight on the table. We have nice meals. <laughs> <laughs> almost accomplished. Okay, so Joel says at least we've had Korech before Shulchan Orech. So, okay, 
I'll, I'll buy that. And let's have Manishtana after Korech, at least. Korech is the sandwich where we have this is the way Hillel used to do it. The Torah tells us that we have to have the Korban Pesach, which we no longer, we, we, we can't have at the moment because we don't have a Beit HaMikdash. But in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, they had the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb. And the Torah says, Al matzot It shall be eaten with Matzah and Marot. So this Rabbi Hillel took it literally and said, oh, you've got to eat it with so what did he do? He got his matzah. What was his matzah like, by the way? It was like a lapa, right? It wasn't, uh, it wasn't like, you know, Yerushalayim matzahs or Yehuda matzahs or, for those of you, those of you who've got good memories in the UK, bombs. Yeah, remember that, Charlie? Yeah. But those were like, you know, flat, crispy matzahs. No, that wasn't matzah. What they had was lapas. So what did he do? He says, okay, the Torah says I've got to have the Paschal lamb with my matzah and my mora. So he made the first pitta, shawarma pitta, that's what he made, roasted meat, and he put it in his laffa, and he put some bitter herbs. What do we have for bitter herbs? Generally speaking, nowadays we have lettuce, yeah? Or a oh, no, no, the charos is not the bitter herbs, charos is something else. You can put that in as well, a bit of, yeah, a bit of kharif as well. Exactly, yeah, you could use that. So what did Hillel do? He made himself a shlamay lapa. Where did we get to that? Oh, yeah. So Joel said, okay, at least we do that before the meal. That's correct. So we could have manishtana after the sandwich. But before we do anything else, before maggid, before... So why did the Rabbanim or the Balagada make manishtana out of order? Any suggestions? Okay, Maggid is the answer to Manishtana. Uh, very, very good. You just gave me a nice intro. So why don't we have Maggid in its right place as well then, after the meal? Okay, that's the fit. So that's not the right answer to the question of why the Rechachamim is a good answer. It's not the answer to the question that I asked, which is why did the Rabbanim make it early on? Okay, so uh, why are we doing it? Whatever the kids are going to notice things are different, and then I say, Well, why are we doing it? And even you know, so you'll say, Oh, you know, we can't have comments, and we're gonna, we're gonna be eating up, so we're going to be okay. So let me answer, let me say your answer, and then I'll answer your question. So that everyone can hear it. Karen says it's because the, the kids ha, are coming to the Seder educated already during the build up to the Seder. They have been told that we're not going to have chametz and we're going to have pitot. OK, fair enough. But you've already then will have answered the questions because when they see you cooking and everything and you say to them all those. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable answer. But I heard Nahama's answer in my duff ear over here. And I'm not going to mention it again. Okay, so <laughs> Nechama's answer, Nechama's answer was a very practical answer, and that is, it's late. That's, who does the Manishtana? The kids. It's late. Even if, like with my own children, you made them go to bed in the afternoon. By the way, my kids all went to bed in the afternoon of uh, Erev Ere Pesach, and none of them slept. Right? They would hear me coming up the stairs to, to check that they were asleep. They would jump in their beds, pull over the covers and pretend to be asleep. And they thought they'd fooled me. Well, I want you to know, boys, you didn't fool me at all. I knew you weren't asleep, but we had to go and try. So um, they haven't gone to sleep in the afternoon. They're too excited about what's going on. So they come to the Seder. They're excited. But if you keep them up and keep them up until after Shulchan or even after Korei, they're going to be asleep and they're going to miss their bit. They're going to miss their big night of standing on a chair and saying Manishtana. So quite simply, the Balagada was a practical reason. He brought it forward uh, and um, they, they would have expected that the, the kids would have done some education, either, as Karen says, in the preparation in the kitchen, in the house and what have you, or, if a bit of luck, at school. 
um, although you can't guarantee that, but you know, hopefully they've learned something in school uh, and, and that. So, so the, the reason that Manishtana is there, out of order, out of Seda, is a quite a simple one. Billy, you wanted to ask me something. Okay, just that my son, right okay all right so i'll just repeat that billy said that in in in, in when his son came to chutzlaret the, from israel and the second seder which wasn't really seder for them they messed about with the order and did had gadia straight after manishtana so that the kids who never got stayed up had gadia. yeah that's a, a perfectly good idea so um that's a, a practical thing now i'm going to suggest to you that the sensible thing to do is to let the kids stay there manage uh, at the beginning because that's you know before they fall asleep and while they're, they're dying to get out you know they're, they're, they're excited and first of all they're shy aren't they they stand up and they, they want to do it and then eventually when they get a bit of courage out it comes and everybody gives them a round of applause and it's wonderful um, and then we're meant to go into Maggid. So the first thing I'm going to suggest to you is that not only am I going to suggest in a second a change in order, a change in Seder, I'm going to suggest a change in place. So anybody here not have what we know as a Seder table? You all sit around a table, right? You come in, it's beautifully set. And um, in our house, since uh, my daughter is uh, an artist and she loves all these things, it's decorated. We have a, a blue runner in the middle of the table, which is all wavy. It's meant to be the yam sort, and we have plastic um, animals for the, for the 10 plagues and all sorts of stuff going on the table. Yeah? So that's, first of all, make it exciting. The kids make it colorful, make it different, make it all that. That's the Seder table. Okay, stop that because you're just about to steal my thunder. Okay, so uh, everybody here uh, has their Seder round a table. I'm going to suggest to you that the first part of the Seder should not be around the table, but should be in the lounge. If you have an open plan, like most of the, the apartments here have got, not got separate dining rooms, like in England, we used to have houses with dining rooms and lounges and separate rooms, actually worked even better there. Not that we did it there, but it would have worked even better because you're in a completely different room. But the, the suggestion is that you come in and you um, uh, sit, uh, stand around the table for Kiddush, and you're around this beautiful Seder table that you sat. And by the way, Seder night is the only night where it is a mitzvah to show off whatever you have in terms of uh, uh, beautiful crockery, pottery, silver, whatever it is, family heirlooms, put them out on the table. Because every other time, you know, if somebody comes to your house for I don't know, Rosh Hashanah and you put out all your splendor and you're saying, look at me, you know. Uh, that's not appropriate. Say the night is absolutely appropriate because we are celebrating what? Freedom. freedom. We're celebrating freedom. We're also celebrating the fact that Akadosh Baruch who brought us out of Egypt, Birchush Kadol, with great wealth. So uh, it's the one night where you can show off your finery. So you should have the table set beautifully and excitingly and colorfully, and all the extra bits and bobs that you're going to have for the kids uh, that you've got ready. And then you stand around the table. And you make kiddush, and then you traipse around the room, right, as if you were leaving Egypt, right. We have in our house, we have a minhag that they. What happens to to the Bnei Israel is that in the end, is they were chased out of Egypt, right? Pharaoh came in the middle of the night and said to Moshe and Aaron, "Get out of here! I've had enough. Out!" And as it were, he chased us out. So we have a minhag in our family that we appoint one person. Para, the wicked para to chase everybody out. It's always my wife. She's always she's always the wicked para, and she chases. And we go around the table, and everybody's running around. And we end up in the lounge, on the sofas and the armchairs. And that way, you are actually 
leaning. Just rocking around. What's the idea of leaning? The idea of leaning is the symbol of freedom. Okay? Because in the old days, in the Roman, the Greek and Roman Empire, they used to eat lying around on those chaises long, right? On their left hand side. Why did they lean on the left hand side, by the way? Nah. That's what you were taught in school. That's what I was taught in school. Nonsense. They're all right handed. So if you're leaning on your left hand side, then you eat with you using your right hand. Okay? Yes, it's true. It's true that the right main bronchus has a slightly uh, uh, wider angle than the left main bronchus, and so it's possible that that, that and that, that is said as a reason. But I was taught that as well, Karen. Uh, but actually, the real reason that we lean on the left hand side is because the Greco Romans, when this minhag was invented, uh, leaned on the left hand side because everybody was right handed, even people who were left handed were right handed. And that went on until about 1950, right? Uh, that people who were left-handed were forced to be right-handed. So everybody was right-handed. So you lay on your left side and you eat with your right hand. Now, the idea of leaning while we're eating um, is something which um, is very difficult for us because, first of all, our um, method of eating is not the Greco-Roman free person's method of lying around on a uh, couch. Okay, well, there is one or, two, one, one or two members of my family that do like to flop about and, and, and eat lying on a couch, but it's not a dumb thing, really, right? We sit around a table, don't we? Now, when you're sitting around a table and you lean, it's meant to be a sign of freedom. So what does it end up being? Here's your, your cup of wine, and you're leaning, and you're leaning to the right hand side like this, and it's really difficult, and it spills down your shirt or your kittle, and it says, oh, really uncomfortable. It's about as unfree as you could possibly get. That's not, it's not the way it should be. That's not what you're meant to do, is to eat down this thing, like leaning to the left-hand side. That's not what it's about. It's about a symbol of freedom. Now, freedom for us in terms of eating would be to, you know, sit around and perhaps, I used to, back in, in Manchester, the only sock to this I used to do is I used to bring in my armchair from the lounge and this reclining armchair which I used to sit there like a king there uh, in my reclining armchair. And but even that's quite difficult to eat lying down. So uh, so don't get hung up on this sitting around the table and leaning things. You're actually doing the opposite of what you're meant to do, which is to, to eat like a free person and eat like a, a, um, a, a lord. So what we do is we do kiddush. We're chased around the room by the wicked pharaoh and we end up in the lounge on the sofas, everybody snuggled up, grandchildren on your lap, you know, cuddling away. And then we do carapace in the head. First of all, we do um, rasa, we wash our hands, or rather, we do bala, washes his hands without a rasa. Another thing that we do, why do we do that? Why does the, the, uh, the bala say that uh, wash his hands? Because uh, that's, he's, the, he's the boss. So what we do in our house is I just sit there and instead of going to the tap to wash my hands like we would normally do, brings a bowl and a cup and uh, we make a big fuss about it that she's the wench and I'm the master and she has to wash my hands and I, she has to bring my uh, 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 towel and I hold my hands out for her to dry them uh, like, she's my, like she's my slave. Right. She's not a slave, she's a free person as well, right? But it's to demonstrate to the kids and the people there that something different is going on here. Manish Tana Laila is there. Normally, mummy's the boss. What's going on here? Manish Tana Laila is there. Okay, that should be the fifth question, right? On all of the nights of the year, mummy tells you what to do. On this night of the year, daddy tells mummy what to do. Okay, so we, so we make a big fuss of that. Um, and again, it's another symbol of freedom. The idea is that we're meant to be having this duality of symbolism here. On the one hand, freedom. On the other hand, we're um, remembering the bitterness and remembering the slavery. So, um, so we then wash our hands and we do carapace. And we do carapace in the Greco-Roman style, okay? Because that you can do. It's only a little bit of potato or parsley, whatever it is you have. And what are we dipping in? This is this duality we're dipping in this vegetable into salt water. The, 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 the duality of this dipping is that on the one hand, dipping is a sign of 
uh, freedom of, of nobility. You go to a posh wedding, right? What happens? Some people walk around with trays and stuff and you're meant to take it off and dip it into the sauce that they've got there. Uh, that's the appetizers, you know, that's, all, that's what happens in posh places. So that's dipping, but we're not dipping into fancy sauce. We're dipping into tears here. Salt water is reminiscent of the tears. So it's a duality here. On the one hand, it's free. On the other hand, it's slavery. So there's a, uh, there is a, a, an argument, a discussion amongst the rabbis as to whether you lean or you don't for carapace because you only lean for the things that are, are freedom. So you don't lean to a arrow, right? I mean, that would be silly. Why would you demonstrate freedom when you're eating a bitter herb? So since the carapace has both aspects, the, the slavery and the freedom, there are some that say lean, some that say don't lean, some that say you can lean, some that say you must lean. Whatever you want, you can do what you like. Okay? You can't go wrong because everybody says something. So what we do is we take the opportunity since we're in the lounge at this point and we're not going to have our meal in the lounge because that's not what we eat. But we can demonstrate this freedom by lounging around in the Greco-Roman style on the left-hand side and dip our little piece of potato, which is what we use, and have our carapace in there. And we've demonstrated by doing that something, A, different. B, we're not at the table. C, we're lying around. Uh, and uh, D, we're dipping. So these are, if you like, we've, we've covered already two of the Manishana things, even before we get to uh, the eating bit. So that's what that we do. And then you would normally answer the Manishtana. The Manishtana is, why are we doing all these things? That's what Manishtana means, Manishtana. So what is different about this night? And then we answer the question. Normally the answer is, we were slaves in Egypt to Pharaoh, and bang, we're into Magid. And then you're on a roll, aren't you? Because where do you, you know, where does it stop? And yeah. The uncle wants to say it's Vatara, and then Moshe wants to argue with the Dvatar and give a different chat. And if you've got this is if you've got Yeshiva Bokhrim, you'll never get to you'll never get to eat, right? <laughs> Those that are not in Yeshiva will be bored because they'll be arguing about some point in a rabbi in the parent. You've got to knock that on the head. Unless you've got only Yeshiva Bokhrim around the table, right? You've got to knock that on the head because you've got the whole of Pesach to do that, not say the night. Okay. So you've got kids, you're going to have a kid's soda. You've got teenagers, you're going to have a, a, a bit more depth to it. And if you've only got adults, then, you know, then you've really got a job on your hands because they are usually, if you've only got adults, it's quite hard to get them motivated. So, so um, you've done your carapace. And then what we then do is we do the manishtana because it's still early and the kids are, uh, are not yet fallen asleep, even though they've had a little cuddle on the couch with the, with the carapace. We do the Manishtana, and then we say, okay, you've asked me some really good questions. You know what? Let's eat, and I'll tell you the answers while we're eating. So what we then do is we jump all the way to Matzah, Maror, and Korich, and we miss out the whole of Magid at this point, and we say, OK, come on, let's go back to the table and let's eat. And while we're eating, I'll tell you the answers to all those questions that you've just asked me. So we then go and we sit down where well, we go and wash for, for uh, matzah. We do motzi matzah. We go and hide the afikoman. We do mara all the way through the seder. That seder goes then from motzi matzah all the way through to up to and including shulchan Aruch. OK, so... It's now only half past eight, nine o'clock, and not half past 10, 11 o'clock when you're eating. So what have you achieved? First of all, you've achieved that people are happy because they're not hungry, okay? They're gonna get food earlier. Secondly, they're not bored because they've not gone into all the different shot him of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfan and, and, and all that stuff yet, okay? On an empty stomach. One year, by the way, uh, uh, we, we had a, uh, a big uh, crowd, and I confiscated everybody's watches um, uh, as they came in, 
I said, right, you have to put your watch uh, in this box here. Nobody's allowed to have a watch on the table. And I made the clocks, they didn't know this, but I made the, I made the clocks an hour slow, right? <laughs> so in the room. So nobody knew what time it was, uh, really. Um, and it made a difference. And you know how it was really interesting? And I did it myself. You know how many times when you don't have a watch on, you look at your watch? You don't, you don't realize how many times a day you look at your watch. I once did that in my uh, in my consulting room. I used to have my uh, clock immediately above my computer so that I could just look at the clock just with my eyes and so that the patient didn't see that I was looking at the clock when they'd been in for more than five minutes, right? So, and, and one, one, uh, one time the clock either broke or the battery went on. Well, it wasn't there or wasn't working. And you realize how many times you look at the clock when it's not there. Uh, and this was the same with the watch and Seder night. So that's another little trick you can do. Confiscate everybody's watches and make your clocks, put your clocks all at different times so they've no idea what time it is. Okay, that's another uh, little trick. So then we go, uh, after we've done the Manishtana, we say, okay, guys, let's go and wash, we'll eat, and we'll discuss. So, not at this point, no, not at this point. Okay. So, huh? Yeah, okay, okay. so you do the, the second coast, right? You can do the second coast before you do your mozi matza. Yeah, yeah, but you, you, can, you can do your coast. You can do your halal if you want to do your halal to have your coast, or you can just have the coast and you can do your halal during what I'm gonna say, okay? Just hold it for a sec. So we go and eat, we do mozi matza, mara, Korech, Shulchan Orech. And during that period, we intersperse all of those things with the Maggid. So if you, and it doesn't have to be in any order, just because they said that you have to have Arabah Bonin before the, the rabbis and before um, whatever else is there and all the Makkas. So what? Put it in a different order. Who cares? Whatever suits you in your conversations. Because what is the point of Maggid? What is the mitzvah of the night? The main mitzvah of the night, right? You've got to teach your children, tell the, the next generation all about it. Makes no difference how you do that as long as you do it. And if by sticking to this rigid order that we've had for all these years, everyone's just going, oh, oh, oh. boring. You've not achieved anything. But if you do things differently, and they think, oh, that's interesting. And then you have your stuff that you've prepared um, and you do the whole of Maggid in whatever order you want to do it. The only difficulty is the second coast, which is which has got to be before um, the, the meal, because the third coast is um, for, uh, for, for benching. So you, you can, and, and really the second coast should be attached to Halel, so because it's, it's part of the, uh, the, the praise but it, it, really, that's, a, you know, it's a fine point of, of it's not even a halakha, really. But yeah, if, if you want to be macked about that, do your halal in, in, in that part there before you're going to start your, your, uh, your eating. But then during the meal, so we ended up the last few years, well, forget COVID, that was a bit of a disaster altogether. But not counting COVID, the last few years, we have ended up having a long because we were doing um, Maggid during Shulchan Aruch. Two advantages to that. Number one, you are not got your eye on the clock for Chatzot because, but no, no, that's number two. Number one, you're not starving because you haven't started till 11 o'clock because everybody wants to get their two pennies in on, 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 on Maggid um, and everybody's, those of them are not getting their two pennies within a board and looking at the watches and saying they're starving and come on, this is ridiculous, and uh, all those things that we've all heard. So that's number one, you don't have that. Number two, you don't have to rush your meal like, with your eye on the clock because you've got to eat the afikoma before it out. So your meal is not rushed. I've been to, uh, at Sazarim, sometimes in my own ones, where you know, you've got 20 minutes to get the whole lot done because you messed about when you came home and the kids weren't get in the right place. And then they started to panic. And, it's always, and then all the different, get to short work, 20 minutes before You've got to eat the afikama. So you don't have that either. 
So you have this long meal um, during which you fulfill the mitzvah of the Higavata of Incha in a manner of freedom. You're not bothered about the time. <laughs> You've got loads of time. You're not bothered about how long the meal takes. You want another course, fine. You want another bowl of soup, another canadol, fine. No problem, because you're talking while it's going on. And the other thing that happens, and it happens almost spontaneously, especially if you've got quite a big seder, is that discussions break out around the table. Now, they won't all necessarily be about you see at Mitzrayim. It might also be about politics or whatever else is going on in the world. But you'll find that if you can pull the strings a bit, as the Baal has said, you can engineer different conversations going, you can hear different conversations going on in different parts of the room. So a couple of the boys will be arguing about the, the response. This is the one that they argue about the most, the response to the Russia, we say to their evil son, um, you know, blunt his teeth, you know, bang him all in the mouth and knock his teeth out and say, ha, if you'd have been there, you wouldn't have even got left, let, let out. On PC today, you know, you might not even allowed to say anything to a child. You can't say that you've done anything naughty. It's just that you could have done that better. And uh, you know, you're not a naughty boy. That was a naughty thing that you did, and all that stuff that we, we have today. So that always generates a bit of argument. So you can, you know, you can uh, engineer that. So you can end up having around the table. You need to have, you know, you need to have the reins a little bit so it doesn't just degenerate. But uh, you can do that because you say, OK, let's let's read the bit now about the four rabbis, five rabbis. Sorry, not four rabbis, five rabbis, right? Five rabbis in Bnei Brak. OK, what were they doing there? This is one we have. What were those five rabbis doing there in Bnei Brak? They were underground, right? How do we know they were underground? They didn't know it was morning. They had to rely on their students. Well, hang on a minute. Why were their students outside? They've gone out for a bag, you know, they've gone out for a quick a quick joint on the uh, outside in the garden. What were they doing there outside? Yes, they were on guard, watching out for the Romans. So these five rabbis must be their Seder night. What were they doing there? They were discussing the politics of the day, as well as you see how it's fine, of course. They were discussing how is this going to affect us? This is a, these are bad times that were going on. This were around, and, and uh, the destruction of Jerusalem was was uh, uh, either occurred or was imminent, and uh, it was this was a bad time. So they were obviously discussing politics, and they were gathering together to learn and teach Torah, which had been banned by the Romans. So the students who were outside. On guard, they probably had a, a rotor. When it came to morning time, they came down into the cellars and says, Hey, Rabotenu, the time's come to Dab Shachre. You know, you've been at this all night. It's time to wrap it up, guys. So um, you could say, Right, okay, let's discuss that. What were they discussing? How do you think they felt about their times that was going on? And that leads you then into different eras. Of the uh, uh, of Jewish history and how they would have stayed there. I remember one time uh, I, I, I came in and I sat down at the stage. This was when it was back in Manchester. And I said, Okay, I'm going to close your eyes. We're going on a time, the time machine and we're going back 2000 years. And then we got back in our time machine and we went back, we went forward to, uh, to 1492, time of the uh, um, Spanish Inquisition, the expulsion from Spain. We then went forward a bit further on to the time of Shabtai Tzvi and further on still to our, my grandparents, the times of the pogroms in, in Eastern Europe and then through into the times of the Holocaust. And that took ages, but it was brilliant because everybody was able to then try and get themselves into the zone of how it must have felt to do a Seder, for example, in Auschwitz. And if you prepare yourselves ahead of time, and there's a ton of stuff on the internet, all you need to do is put Seder in Auschwitz into Google, and you've got material there. Put Seder at Spanish Inquisition, you've got material there. Today, it's a doddle, because it's, the information's all out there. It takes preparation. You know, you've got a week now, so it's not quite, to get this together. But choose one particular thing, one, and you can then, and if you're going to do this, during the meal, 
um, you can actually make these conversations really meaningful. Uh, and uh, you, it can then be a, a, a journey, not just from, uh, from Mitzrayim, but all the way through Jewish history as well. Um, another advantage of doing it this way is that you've, you've actually combined two things together, Magid and the meal, so they're overlapped. They've actually saved time, so it doesn't drag. So there's less boredom. And by the time you come to the end, people are now are ready. They're not falling asleep and they're not, you know, come on, let's get this over here. Chagad yoh, chagad yoh. They're ready for a good old sing song through Hallel and, and uh, if you like our family, which are pretty unmusical. No, no, that's not fair. We are totally unmusical, right? Um, we've all got lousy voices and um, none of us can really hold a tune. And we just say, OK, look, we know it's not very good. It's a one night. My kids used to tell me when I used to sing Zemira. So I mean, probably said, oh, Dad, do me a favour. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, and it, it was horrible. I said, yeah, I used to, and I say it, say tonight, I don't care how bad it is. I'm going to sing because I like it. I like these tunes. And so we all get stuck in and we all sing. Um, and it's a horrible noise. <laughs> but, no, I can't hear this horrible. But for me, it sounds beautiful. It's wonderful music. So, um, um, and, and then you finish at a reasonable time. Um, and so uh, the, the things that we've, we've said here, uh, uh, I'm gonna just summarize so far, and then I'm gonna add in something else the last few minutes before we go on to questions. So what we've said is, don't be stuck with the Seder. The, uh, the reason I told you about the Manish Tana in the first place is because the Manish Tana was not originally where the rabbis put it. The rabbis put it because of what the Chana said. We'll see. Have a look in Psachim, uh, chapter 10, Mishnah 4. Uh, it tells you about the four questions that are asked there. And they're not the same four questions that we have uh, because they ask a question about uh, the Korban Pesach. You replace that with the leaning business because uh, we don't have a Korban Pesach anymore. Have a look in uh, Psachim 10.4. Um, and you'll see that uh, the answer then is, uh, of course, is Magid. Um, and it's clear from there that the, the Chachamim, have, because of the types of the questions that are being asked, the Chachamim who put the, the, put the Haggadah together changed the order. So we don't need to be stuck with an order. Okay, If by sticking to the order, you are failing in the mitzvah of the Gadot Alevincha, then... It's pointless. Okay, you stuck to the Seder. Wow, I've done the Seder. I've done all 15 steps of the Seder. Aren't I good? Yes, but you didn't do the main mitzvah, which is the Gavit the mitzvah because your kids were bored. So you don't have to stick with, this, with the order. Use your facilities. Prepare the table in an exciting way. Prepare your lounge. If you've got couches and if you've got armchairs, spread out the armchairs. If you've got reclining chairs, make them recline. Bring a whole bunch of pillows down. Uh, from the bedrooms and put them on the floor for the kids to lie on. They love kids love lying. If you've got bean bags, that's even better. If you haven't, just bring loads of, bring down a few duvets and 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 uh, uh, um, pillows. The kids love it. They're having a sleepover in the lounge. Wow, amazing. It's different. Manish Tana Halal completely different. So use your facilities. When you are doing your carapass, if you have the Minag to lean, I would say to you, if you don't have any minah, I would say it this way, say it again. Unless you have a very strong minah not to lean on carapace, why not? Do it, and do it in the Greco-Roman style, and explain to your guests and your kids around that this is how they did it 2,000 years ago. This is how people uh, ate. They lay around, and people came and served them, and, uh, and the wench used to come and wash the, the master's hands and all that kind of stuff. Make it uh, um, uh, very clear to them that this is all about freedom and then um, the biggest the most radical thing of all is to move Magid to within the Shulchan Aruch to, with, within the time that you're eating the meal um, and so that you uh, are not having all the negative things and you've got all the positive things so those are a few other things and now now just to before we go on to questions I want to talk to you about a controversial so topic which is how many cups of wine we have at the Seder. There is, there is a mitzvah to have 
Four cups of wine. Why do we have four cups of wine? Can they get the four expressions of Gula? Where do we find that? Come on, Soifer Stam, where you've written this. Where do, where do we find it? Which parasha? Oh, close. That era. Yeah, beginning of that era. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 6, if you want to look it up. All right, so I'll read it to you. Lachain, therefore, Emor Livnei Yisrael, say to the Bnei Yisrael, Ani Adonai, I am Hashem, Vod Seiti, Etchem, Mitachat Sivlot Mitzrayim. I will take you out from underneath the burden of Mitzrayim. Vehitzalti Etchem, and I will save you. Same word as Hatzala. Okay, what does Hatzala do? You got your Hatzala jacket on, Billy? Save people. Vehitzalti, I will save you. Me'avodatam, from their slavery, or from the slavery of them. Vega'alti Etchem, and I will redeem you, whatever that means. Bizra'a Natuya, with an outstretched arm. Uvishvatin Gedolim, and with great judgments. Velakachti etchem li, and I will take you to me, which is what? Marriage, okay? That's how you, that's the expression of marriage. Hu lakach la leisha, he took her. Yeah, take a wife. So that's, we're getting married to Hashem, we're bound to him. That's number four. And I will be a God for you. And you will know. I am Hashem, your God. I am God who took you out of uh, the burden of Mitzrayim. So there's our four, four expressions, right? Only not right. Because the next verse says... And I will bring you. You can see it's the same, it's the same style. Okay. Uh, it's the same style. Why do the rabbis stop before we get to the Heveti? And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give you your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why does that not get a cup of wine? Only four get a cup of wine. And it's a mitzvah, Drabana, to drink those cups of wine on, on uh, Seder night. Why did they stop there? Not fair, says Vehevati. What about me? So, what's the answer? They were still waiting at that point. Correct. Where is that? What was the Haggadah written? After. Yeah, it, it evolved. Yeah. But it, it, the earliest part of it is from Mishnaic times. Mishnaic times were when? 200, something like that. In other words, 150 years after the exile. Okay. After the Khurban, after the exile from Israel. So. When this Haggadah was written, and when it was put together, and it evolved over a long period of time, bits were added, and then another bit were added, and the Bnei Brak bit was added, and then all sorts of things. And if you if you want to look and see the history of the Haggadah, there are some people who've written really deep research into how the Haggadah was put together. It's fascinating. It's not for now, but it's fascinating. Um, but in all periods of the evolution of the Haggadah, we were in exile. And so that fifth cup of the Heveti was not drunk. It was, however, and has always been present on our Seder table. What am I talking about? Kos Shel Eliyahu. And what is that Kos Shel Eliyahu? It's the Kos that Eliyahu Anavi will drink when he comes. And when is he going to come? When Sure. He's going to come on Wednesday. Night. So when, when Elianovi is going to be the, it's going to be the bearer of the news that we have reached Mashiach times. Okay. Okay. 
wait. So for generations, we have had a fifth cup waiting to be drunk. And what's that fifth cup represent? It represents the fifth expression, the Heveti, and I, have, I will bring you to the land which your fathers, which I swore to your fathers to give you. Does it say, I will bring you to Yerushalayim Habanuya, where the Beit HaMikdash will be rebuilt? What does it say? David's shaking his head there. David, loud and clear, what does it say? I will. Beheveti. Etchem. Where are we? Yes. El Haaretz. To the land. Asher nasati etiadi, which I have placed my hand upon. Latet ota. To give it. La Abraham. Li Yitzchak. Li Yaakov. So there are those who say. And I count myself amongst them, not amongst them because I didn't think of it, but amongst their followers who agree that the time has come to drink that fifth cup of wine because we have been brought to this land. That pasuk, the first four have been fulfilled. took us out of Egypt. The he saved us. The Gaalti, and he redeemed us with an outstretched arm. And I'll take you, and he's done that. We are his people. And now we and our generation are witness to the fact that the Heveti has been fulfilled as well. We have been brought back to this land. The first time in 2,500 years, or more even, 2,700 years, since there was Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Remember, all the way through the, the period of, of the second Beit HaMikdash, we were not sovereign in our own land. We were, vass were a vassal state at best under the Greeks and under the Romans. We had a short period of time where, during the Chashmonaim and the, and the Bar Kochba revolt, but basically, for more than 2,000 years, we did not have sovereignty in our land, and now we do. And who has brought us back? Not Koichi Vyetzim Yodi. It's not us. We had to do our part, not me, I didn't do anything, just turned up. But those that came here in blood, sweat and tears, they played their part. Who's the main player here? Kodesh Baruch Hu. Behei Veiti, why are we ignoring it? So my minhag has become that we drink a fifth cup of wine. Now, there are halachic problems with that because we have an, also have a commandment Al Tosif, you're not allowed to add on. If you decide you want to have five, uh, I know that sounds a bit weird, five, four species. You want, instead of having four species on Sukkot, you want to have five, you're not allowed. You know, you've got to have four. That's a mitzvah de Oraisa. Mitzvah de Rabbonon, first of all, or sure, you also shouldn't be Baal Tosif. But there is a way to do this without being Baal Tosif, without being adding on to it and saying chutzpah. Uh, uh, I'm going to, you know, leave them in those better than, than 2,000 years of Masorah, and I'm going to change the Masorah. No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that we are looking at this from a positive point of view. We are fortunate to have been in a position to be able to celebrate the Heveti, and never you lot, for the last 2,000 years, were not, because it wasn't there. You, you couldn't say the Heveti, you couldn't drink to the Heveti, you were in Golos. So how do you do this technically without upsetting the apple cart and being baltoist? So uh, for those of you who um, either are interested just to know or are interested to do, uh, I have produced a little sheet here, which I will send around. Um, and I'll explain to you now, but I'll send it around for those of you who are interested. Okay, so the way to do it is like this. We um, normally, what we do is we have our third cup uh, and then we have our fourth cup um, and then we say, I like FN, okay? So here's how to do it. When we finish saying the, uh, the Hallel, right? The, the long Hallel after the meal, then we do our fourth cup, okay? Pardon me, we say, break free our Gafen at the end of the long Hallel. And then we say very priya and normally we would then say al hagefen, al priya okay? 
Um, so if you want to do the fifth cup, when you make the bracha on the fourth cup of wine after Hallel, you have in mind that you are going to cover the fifth cup with your bracha of the fourth cup. There's a big question anyway, it's not for now, it's our pilpul, as to why we need four cups anyway. I mean, why we need four brachas anyway? Because normally you make one break per coffin and then you drink as much wine as you want. Meal, right? So why do we have four? Another question. So the fourth cup, when you say the break per have in mind that you're going to have a fifth cup. And don't then say, because that's your after bracha that says that's in I'm in anymore now. So you say that bracha break pre coffin and you drink the wine, but you don't then say your after bracha. And then you um at the end of the Hodul Hashem Kitovs, all that all those long, long Hodul Hashem Kitovs, then you drink the fifth cup without a bracha because you've already made it, and then you can make your Allah Gefen. So you've still got four birchat uh, Only if you're worried about Baal Tosef, you can stop yourself by saying the fourth cup, I just split it into two. And this is a way of, if you like, covering all options. You're not being Baal Tosef, you're not saying a chutzpah, I'm going to say I, I have a, a fifth bracha. No, I've still got four brachas, four cups of wine. Only the fifth one, uh, Part of the fourth one is a fifth one, and there's a fifth one. You know why? Because it's a it's a it's a lack of a chorus at all not to do it. Because the British broke brought us, us, our generation. What did we do? What did we do to, 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 to deserve that? I have no idea. But whatever a British broker's plan is, I'm very grateful for it. That we're able to sit here in this brilliant place, despite all the nonsense that's going on out there. This is still the best place in the world to be. A I saw a thing. Uh, so As I was driving, I was on a, on a bridge. It was basically a, a, an Israeli flag. Instead of the Magnus Ovid in the middle, it said, um, Le daber mutar, lisno asur, anachnu achim. <laughs> Which, for those that don't know what it means, it said, to speak or to discuss is permitted. To hate is forbidden. We are brothers. Now, I don't believe that you would ever see a sign like that, for example, in America yeah. with, the, with Democrats and Republicans saying, you know, we can discuss, but we can't hate each other. You know what? Because we're all brothers. I don't believe, and you certainly won't see it in the UK, Tories and Labour, you know. No. Anachnu achim. And that's the point. We are here in this amazing place because the Kodesh Baruch has allowed it. And for me, the most important part of the Seder is when I drink that fifth cup. Because when I drink that fifth cup, I'm completing the circle. Kodesh Baruch Hu put us in Egypt. He took us out. He took us through the Midbar. He gave us the Torah. He brought us to Eretz Israel. We mucked it up. He kicked us out. We brought back. We mucked it up again. He kicked us out. It was a long wait. And now we're back. So for me, the culmination of the Seder is when I drink that fifth cup at the end of Hodul at the night he saw the and Drink that fifth cup, and I'm saying, wow, this, I am drinking, literally, the fruits of the whole of the Jewish history. Uh, and for me, that's a very, very powerful thing. Those of you that would like to do it, I will send this out on the group, and you'll be able to uh, to, to do it if you like. Okay, I'm going to stop now. I'm going uh, I'm going to ask for questions in the room, and then I'll go to questions in the Zoom room. Um, so, first of all, questions in the room. Nechama, we'll go around the table. It's fine. Nechama. Okay, so uh, Nechama said that she's heard for the first time about a coast Miriam. Okay, now I've never heard of that until uh, Nechama actually mentioned it to me uh, on Shabbat. Uh, I'd never even heard of that. Um, uh, of course, it's a made up thing. Uh, there's no such thing as Kos Miriam. But hey, why not? Miriam was a really important person. right? If it wasn't for Miriam, nothing would have happened because we'd all be dead of thirst. Because in Miriam's Zachut, we had 
Be'er Mayim. So why not put a, a cup of water on the table and talk about Miriam's role in Yitzhak Mitzrayim? Talk about Miriam's role looking after uh, Moshe as a kid. Hadn't been for Miriam. No Moshe. No Moshe. Maybe no Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Miriam's pivotal here. Talk about Miriam with, uh, with um, Kriyat Yansuf, the way she came out and sang, um, the way Miriam looked after the, the people with the Be'er and Miriam. So, yes, by all means. I, so, it's made up, so what? It's a great idea. Let's have a cup. Let's even have it better than that. Why don't we have some kind of water, water feature, you know, like some kind of... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Tambourines, tambourines are a bit problematic, aren't they, because of the music? Yeah. But yeah, I think I, I think a cost Miriam's a great idea. I'm all for that. Yes, Billy. Okay, maybe. Yeah, excellent. Great idea. We're saying Lishana Hababi Yushalai. Hatikva is problematic for some people, uh, particularly the Chabadnikim. Uh, the, the, the Chabadnikim are very, are very touchy about Hatikva because it doesn't have God's name in it. Um, but hey, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, it represents uh, you can have God in your heart, it doesn't have to be in the words. Okay, it's not a tefillah, it's a, it's a statement. So yeah, I'm all in favor of that. Anyone else around the table, David? <laughs> Okay. Let me just uh, say that for those that won't have heard. Uh, David said that it's interesting that the Bala Gada chose the vidui, the 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 confession is not the right word, declaration that the person makes when he uh, when he's in Eretz Israel, if you have first fruits, you bring them to the temple, uh, the Beit HaMikdash, and you say this this uh, declaration, and the declaration that we say, with that, we will all know it when we have a Beit HaMikdash, we bring our Bikurim, we'll all know it, because we say, I'll say it, Arami, Ove Davi, and that whole thing, and I've cleared that, and here's the Bikurim, and, and what's all that about? That is about us saying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, wow, thank you so much for bringing us to this land where I can grow fruit and bring it to the Beit HaMikdash. So the fact that the Baal HaGadah chose that is a hint to us about the centrality of what this is all about. So I agree with that. This one, the third one. Talking about the fifth cup being the Hebe. What does the person declare when he brings the green with the basket? Hey, 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 yeah, same word. Hey, 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 same hey, word. Hey, hey, I never thought of that. That's I'm brilliant. Brilliant. Excellent. Wonderful. Any others? Not, has not come and said, okay, we're at the Google stage. Okay, so if you are, um, if Mashiach is a an individual who will come riding in on a white donkey preceded by a declaration by Eliyahu Anavi, then you can say we are only the Right at the very beginning, Reshit Smichak Gulatenu. He doesn't say Ralph Cook didn't say Reshit Gulatenu, he said Reshit Smichat Gulatenu, just the beginnings of the sproutings. Um, so uh, drink a little bit of the cup, right? Uh, <laughs> like, drink the beginnings of the cup. However, if if you like me and you don't, and the Rambam, as it so happens, not that the Rambam asked me, but if you are like me on the Rambam, um, who uh, speaks in Moran of Uchim about an idea of the times of Mashiach, that Mashiach is not such a, it's not like, you know, a Wizard of Oz, a person there that's going to come <laughs> riding in on a white donkey, uh, and, you know, and the, and the, the lion is going to lie down with a white picture and all that stuff from Yeshaya. But this is a time of Mashiach, and... Uh, 
um, they, that, that the, 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 the criteria that need to be met are that most of the Jews have been brought in, kibbutz, galuyot, we're almost there, we're about 49% of the world Jewry live in Israel. We have sovereignty over the land. There is a Melech al Yisrael, no politics, please, but we are at least sovereign in our land. Okay. And the third one is not yet there. That's the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash. However, we could have done it. We could do it. Har Habayit Biadeinu. We have the ability to do it. Okay. Politically, it might not be so expedient at the moment, but we have the ability to build a third Beit HaMikdash. It's our land. It's in our hands. Har habayit biadinu. So all I'm saying to you is that there is certainly a sad, there is certainly a position to take that we are living uh, at the very worst at the beginning of the footsteps of Mashiach. I would go much further than that and say that we are living at the at the entrance times of the time of Mashiach, if not in Mashiach times, and. In my own personal view, is if you're waiting for a guy on a white donkey, you're going to be waiting a very long time because I don't think it's going to happen. But that's just my heretical views. You don't have to buy them at all. Uh, uh, ben, you. Yes, yes, yes. You can, you can, you can. Yeah, you can. No reason why not. Absolutely no reason why not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other questions in the room? Okay, Zoomers, we have uh, a dozen of you or so. Uh, any questions? If you have a question, unmute and speak. No questions on Zoom. Okay, in that case, call it a day. Chag Sameach, everyone. Chag Sameach. Thank you very much. No, I was about to ask you.